What's going on, guys? So this is my full review for The Walking Dead comic book series by Robert Kirkman. I read it for the very first time this year. I actually uploaded all of these reviews individually as I finished the compendiums. There's four compendiums in total, so I did four individual videos, but I figured I would throw them all together in one giant video. So if it's your first time watching or if you want to watch the reviews again, you don't have to go from video to video. You can just watch it all in one fell swoop, and this will also serve as my overall thoughts and opinions on the entire entire Walking Dead comic series, so I hope you guys enjoy, and thanks for watching. For better or for worse, and probably for worse, for over the past decade, the Walking Dead television franchise has been as inescapable as the zombie apocalypse itself, with the main series lasting 11 seasons long and tons of spin-off shows to accompany it. When it began airing back in 2010, I was immensely excited for the show, and it was one of the first times I caught a series premiere of something on that first episode, Halloween Night, that I would follow for seasons to come. During the beginning of the show's run, I was familiar with the comic book that the show was going to be based on, having read the first couple of volumes that I borrowed from a high school friend of mine that was obsessed over zombie media. Thank you, Matt. But I never actually kept up with the comic book and probably only read those first original 30 to 35 chapters. After that, I watched the show over the years, and I knew they had changed some things from the comics, so I knew they couldn't be as graphic as the comic did at times, and I knew that they changed things about characters, but as I try to continue to watch the show season after season, watching it get worse and worse in quality over time was almost making it unbearable to watch anymore as I saw it dragging out storylines forever, ruining character dynamics that were set up in the source material, and pushing TV show original characters way too hard over the other ones. And also, perhaps its biggest disservice, killing off or writing off comic book characters that have massively more important stories to tell, and then removing the heart of the series itself with Rick Grimes' departure. And I get it, it's an adaptation, so it's not going to be a play-by-play -play of the comic, but for years now, I have had this nagging desire to return to the comic book world and remind myself what this story was supposed to be and why the comics were so influential. So, I read all of the first compendium, which collects the issues number 1 through number 48, which is basically the first 25% of the series, and I wanted to give you guys my thoughts. I also thought it would be fun to review a western comic book rather than my usual manga reviews, plus October is right around the corner, and a zombie series definitely lends itself to that spooky season, so please indulge me. The Walking Dead is a black and white horror comic created by Robert Kirkman, also known for creating the series Invincible. It takes a lot of elements and inspiration from the classic zombie horror films, but most particularly the George Romero Living Dead series. Even having the comic book in black and white makes it feel very reminiscent about that first film, and while reading it, I would even listen to some of the soundtrack from Night of the Living Dead, and it fits pretty well. And just like the Romero films, the zombie story being told here is about the degradation and desperation of the human survivors in a world of chaos and what it does to them over time. It's about how humans interact and distrust one another in desperate situations, and how can we have the highest highs in life and then, without warning, be brought down to our lowest low. How the world is indifferent to any of us, and any of us are capable of meeting our end at any moment. With the looming idea of hope pressing further and further away with each passing day, month, and year that this apocalypse continues to persist in. There's themes about the beauty of survival, but also about the hopelessness of it all. Is it even worth still trying to survive? Or are we, not the zombies, but us humans that are left, are we the real walking dead. The story centers around a police officer in the south near Atlanta named Rick Grimes. He's shot in the line of duty and then wakes up from a coma much later to find that the world has been overrun with zombies and barely any humans remain in the city. He begins a search for his wife Lori and his son Carl while meeting a group of survivors in the outskirts of the city. We are put into the same confusing perspective as the characters are. We are unsure as to how or why this happened or if anybody is coming to rescue them. Hell, they don't even know if this is an isolated incident or happening worldwide. And it's good to put us into that perspective because it makes us as confused and desperate as the characters are to find out any kind of new information that there is and rarely do they come across any. And rarely do they get a chance to even think about it before being attacked once more by more zombies. And Rick's return already begins to put him at odds with his former partner Shane, and how believing Rick was dead, Shane and Lori had a brief romantic encounter that may have resulted in Lori's pregnancy. 
The rest of the cast includes many characters that were on the TV series but are vastly different in just about every aspect of their character. The standouts are Andrea, whom in the comics becomes a very hardened warrior after having to kill her sister that was infected, and she also has a relationship with Dale, whom survives a lot longer than his television counterpart. When Tyrese is introduced, he also becomes way more important than the TV version of him, and basically, along with Rick, kind of become like co-leaders of the group. I like their dynamic quite a bit, and it only made it harder when they eventually came at odds with one another during the prison arc. Both characters have gone through a lot of loss and pain, although I think Tyrese really gets put through the ringer in this series. What this man has to witness and lose during the prison arc is downright some of the most depressing stuff that I have ever read, and without giving anything away, he doesn't exactly have the greatest resolution by the end of the arc. Glenn and Maggie are depicted pretty much the same as the early seasons of the TV show, two young survivors that become madly in love and obsessed with one another in a handful of adorable and maybe corny ways, but I don't care, I love that shit. Speaking of, the comic does have a lot of focus on relationships and hookups between the characters, but all of it makes a lot of sense. During a supposed apocalypse, you would probably be looking for any happiness you could find, whether it's falling in love or just getting an orgasm for the night, so I get it. But it also causes a good deal of drama for the characters, falling for those that they shouldn't, being cheated on, betrayals, and everything else that you can imagine when feelings and physicality get in the way. The comic does get pretty graphic, but mostly just with the gore. When it comes to the sexual aspects of it, there's not a ton of panels of explicit scenes. It's usually just one panel to get the point across that the characters are uh, going at it. And like I said, even though the zombies are a constant threat, there's a commentary that's always about a play on the nature of humanity and how we respond to horrible situations. How some of us break down just wishing to be killed and how some of us use that pain and use that anguish in order to persevere, become stronger, and to help those around us. But one of the biggest themes of the first quarter of the series, at least, is, is it right to kill if you know there is a threat in the future? Without law and order, the only authority really comes down to violence, who has the most power, and who can make others submit. The group eventually makes it to a prison, which seems like a sanctuary in these times. Clearing it out, they would be able to be well protected from the outside world. But inside, they meet four convicts that are still there. And there's an immediate distrust based on the fact that the criminals are there and what their crimes may have possibly been. Are they lying about them? What did they actually do? None of the characters really know. And what can they do? Do they just lock the prisoners back up? Do they make them leave the prison? Do they try to integrate them into the group? Or do they just try to kill them to save the resources because these prisoners might be killers themselves? And it's interesting to see how the characters handle the idea of killing and when the right time to kill is and how long it takes before you're desensitized to the act of killing. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, I'm going to have to get into some spoilers. So if you don't want to know anything, go ahead and turn back now. I would recommend the comic if you guys want to check it out. But there's no way I can talk about the next part without getting into some specifics. Okay, so you've been warned. The story really starts to ramp up around the mid-20 chapters. And that's when we're introduced to our first real antagonist of the comic, The Governor. And he is radically different than the TV show version of him. This guy is so unbelievably unhinged. I don't even I don't even know where to start. He's this hillbilly looking guy that managed to gather his own group of survivors in a town that he keeps safe for them, as well as gives them entertainment by throwing living humans into gladiator like matches that he captures against the zombies themselves. Again, just purely for entertainment. He captures Rick, Glenn, and Michonne and attempts to do the same with them, but it gets way worse. Upon meeting Rick, one of his first actions is to literally cut off Rick's hand for basically no reason, just to assert his dominance. It is crazy because for the rest of the entire comic run, Rick will have to not have his right hand, and it's all thanks to just this maniac in this one horrible situation. But then he has Michonne tied up in a storage garage where he periodically goes in to rape her whenever he wants. What the fuck? 
He also keeps his zombie daughter tied to a chain and feeds her random body parts, including Rick's hand, also rips out all of her teeth so he could kiss her on the mouth, I don't know, and then he stares at zombie heads in fish tanks just contemplating his life. This guy is just chaotic and nuts, and he was never showcased in the TV show like this. The comic version of him basically makes him feel like he should be part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre family, and in a way, I'm here for it, but in another way, it is just disturbing. Rick, Glenn, and Michonne do eventually escape, but not before Michonne goes back to fight the governor one-on-one -on -one and get her revenge. Chopping off his arm, ripping off his dick, and gouging out his eyeball. It's very cathartic and a pretty disturbing scene in itself. Michonne's mental health is definitely going down to the gutter with all of this happening. But the worst part is she doesn't quite finish the job because somehow the governor manages to survive, and that's when he causes his quest for vengeance to be put upon the prison itself. Now, when it comes to Rick and Lori, I think that they do have a pretty good relationship overall. They have some pretty high emotional stakes, Lori being pregnant, and Rick constantly leaving and not coming back, so there is a lot of tension between them two, not to mention the subtle resentment where Rick is constantly questioning if the child in her stomach is actually his or if it's Shane's. Lori manages to give birth eventually to a healthy baby girl, and things are happy for a moment, even though bringing a child into this world seems like a horrible idea, when she is finally born, there are those who can't help but be taken aback and calmed by her potential. But that's just a setup for the tragedy that strikes right after. Almost like saying no matter what good happens, horrible things will happen right after it. The carnage of the assault on the prison by the governor is worthy of an art climax, but left me with more of a feeling of loss than the TV show ever did. The governor beheads Tyrese in front of everybody, he begins pelting the prison with firearms, and he eventually gets inside, kills Herschel's son, kills Herschel himself, but the biggest death is Lori, who is gunned down while running with her newborn baby. The final panel of the first compendium ends with Rick holding his only son Carl, the two of them alone, believing that Lori and the baby are something that they will have to leave behind forever, with their once great sanctuary burning in the distance behind them. The governor is also killed within the carnage, but it's a death that is hard to feel very pleased with because so much has fallen into despair. But storytelling-wise, this is what the series needed. It moves us into the next era of The Walking Dead, and it lets the readers know to never get too complacent because it can all be torn to shreds in an instant. But ultimately, like with all stories, the thing that makes it succeed are the characters. Robert Kirkman works very hard to humanize most of the main cast, and he's not afraid to highlight their shortcomings or frustrations. Those hot-tempered moments that you'd mostly be ashamed of are often on full display because everything is so difficult and everything is so frustrating, it's what makes the pleasant moments feel even more special and earned over time, and what makes the violence and death feel more impactful as well. With the comic book, I don't feel like I'm waiting for something to happen forever. It all moves at a pretty decent pace. But it also does have a lot of dialogue per issue, which was a little bit surprising but makes a lot of sense. It can at times feel like a bit much, but it's necessary for laying out what each character is going through at any given moment and trying to understand the decisions that they are making. Continuing my journey through the Walking Dead comic series, I just finished the second compendium, which goes from chapters 49 to 96. So obviously, this video is going to be filled with spoilers for that segment. This is my first time reading through the series, and it picks up right after the end of the prison arc and the wake of the devastation that happened there. And so many major characters were killed there, Tyrese, Herschel, and most prominently for our protagonist Rick, it was the death of his wife Lori and even their newborn child. And I was legitimately shocked that they actually did kill off the baby as well. I was thinking maybe somebody would show up with her at some point, or somebody got her out of the prison, or maybe she didn't really get shot, but no. The comic actually went there, and by doing so, it takes Rick and Carl into very interesting directions, as they are all that's left of his family, and basically now the heart and soul of the story. And this portion of the comic really seemed to ramp up Carl's involvement and his characterization. In the first compendium, Carl was always there, and he was important, but mostly just by proxy of being Rick's son. Here, Carl gets a lot more to do, a lot more screen time, and it's kind of like a coming-of-age tale that's happening here in the midst of the overall story that we're given. I really liked a lot of it, and I liked what they were doing with Carl. I'm really excited to see where he goes moving forward, because I know in the comic, he goes on a lot longer than he was in the show, so I'm excited to see it. 
Carl is forced to defend himself multiple times from zombies by himself, and although he sees his dad as a hero, it's almost as if he feels the need to pick up the slack for the things that Rick cannot do, or the times where Rick is just too physically exhausted to do it. And Rick, during these chapters, man, Rick Grimes, during these chapters, the breakdown and fall of his sanity was heartbreaking to read, not just for him talking to imaginary voices over the phone, but wanting to be that strength for his son Carl, while at the same time having so much pain and trauma that he has to release somehow in some way, and at times just comes pouring out of him whether he wants it to or not. The father-son themes that are on display here, they really touch me because I see it from both angles, and I'm a sucker for father-son dynamics and stories anyways. I see a son wanting his father to be okay, and a father wanting to be able to teach his son the right thing and provide an example for him, but how exactly do you teach him right and wrong when there is no order to the world, when there's no structure, and in a world where killing is not only acceptable, but also a necessity to survive? And when Rick is torn away from everything, it's that panic survival mode that kicks in within him, that instinctual desire to do whatever it takes to see the next day. There's a scene where a group of thugs threaten to rape Carl, and Rick just bites their throats out and becomes just as animalistic as the zombies themselves. When Rick said his iconic line of, we are the walking dead, I think that was the coming full circle point here, which could lead me into another point that I want to make, but it would be getting ahead of myself a little bit, so let me try to talk in order. Rick and Carl do manage to meet back up with other survivors from their group, Andrea, Dale, Glenn, Maggie. Maggie also, who early on here attempts to kill herself by hanging in order to escape this violent world that they're in right now, and she's only salvaged by Glenn and the love that he has for her, and that he sees beyond what she sees for herself and in their potential of the future. She actually doesn't have a lot to do during the second compendium, but the relationship between her and Glenn still is shown to be one of the more positive forces in the entire series. Also, we're introduced to a trio of characters, Abraham, who is just this super tough badass guy with a handlebar mustache. He's awesome. Alongside him, a beautiful girl named Rosita, who is definitely waifu vibes, and Eugene, who claims to have insight into what caused the zombie outbreak and can help fix it if only they get him to Washington, D.C. in time. And it's funny that we introduce a concept like this now because after we've already seen so much, and because if this was a plot point early on in the series, I probably would have bought it. But it seems incredibly obvious that this guy is full of shit, and so is his story. One thing about this comic is it's been, I don't necessarily want to say grounded, but it's never been like superheroes on a rescue mission. These characters are flawed, they fly off the handle, stress gets the better of them, and let's face it, they're just a bunch of random southerners that all got stuck together. A race against time plot to get some kind of super genius scientist over to the capital in order to stop the zombie apocalypse from going further just sounds like the plot of a bad action movie and not something that you would see in The Walking Dead. And of course, Eugene is found out to be a liar, but they do make significant effort in order to move themselves north. But not before encountering a bunch of cannibals! Dale gets abducted and gets his fucking legs eaten off. What the fuck? Not to worry, though, because Dale was bitten by a zombie, and so all of them ate tainted meat, which he screams at the top of his lungs as he starts laughing, going into madness. This scene is crazy. Now, I know if you watch the TV series, the cannibal segment is a lot longer. In the comic, it all happens pretty fast, or at least it felt fast. But the same emphasis here is applied with Rick savagely leading the charge against them and hacks them to pieces without any empathy, at least not at the time. It's that moment to show that Rick's group, no matter what they come up against, is a force to be reckoned with, and they're not taking any chances anymore. Which leads into kind of the thing that I want to talk about. Because soon after, Rick and his group are found by a guy named Aaron who takes them to his location, which is a fully barricaded and functioning town. Not like what the governor had, but an actual peaceful society being maintained by a bunch of people who are very good at what they do. They welcome Rick's group in and seem to be exactly what they say they are without any kind of deception. The only suspicious part is they want them to take their weapons as soon as they come in because they don't allow weapons within the town themselves. Now, they can still go get their weapons if they want to, but it's when they're leaving the town or in case of emergencies. So it's a little suspicious, but makes sense if you're trying to maintain a peaceful society, I suppose. They basically want Rick to do his job again. They want him to be a police officer, and they give all the others in his group jobs as well. But the way this goes down is incredibly interesting because 
Now you have Rick, who has had to sink to his lowest points of savagery just to survive, who has had his hand hacked off, had to bite a man's throat out, he had to kill cannibals, and all of these things just to be thrown back into society like nothing ever happened. And so Rick begins to view everything here with a suspicious lens and makes things seem more dangerous than they actually are and also views the people here as being extremely weak because they haven't gone through the same experiences, that they don't understand or maybe they don't even deserve to be living the way that they're living. He conducts a mission with Glenn in order to steal their weapons back in the middle of the night, and he also takes it upon himself to interrogate a man who he thinks is beating his child. And there's this one line I love where he says, if they ever try to make us leave this place, we'll just take it from them. And... This is a direction that I wish, I wish the comic would have doubled down on harder. I get why they didn't, but I love the idea that our group and Rick essentially becoming antagonists right under our noses, that the shift would be so gradual, and by going on their heartbreaking journeys, we would be on their side the entire time and continue to justify all of their actions because we understand them as characters. I think it would have been so wild if the story shifted, and from an outside perspective, Rick does infiltrate the town. He does tear down its power system and completely takes it over. And he kind of does that, but I wonder how long the comic would have pushed this before we, as the reader, realized that Rick was the bad guy now. It plays with these ideas, but it doesn't go all the way with it. And I'm not saying the comic made the wrong choice in the long run. It makes more sense, especially with the Negan storyline coming up and all that, but man, do I love the idea of turning a protagonist into a villain without the reader even realizing it before it's too late. And if I didn't already know about the Negan character and that he was going to show up eventually, that is the direction I would have thought the comic was going to go in, and that's what I would have really, really hoped for. But it's okay. If I want a series like that, I got Breaking Bad, I got Attack on Titan, I'm just saying, I thought it would have been interesting. Although Rick does go off the deep end plenty of times here, but eventually he settles into his role and proves to be somebody that the town needs, even if not everybody respects him at first. Eventually, a huge herd of zombies, and if you want to think about how dark Rick's character can be, well, he ends up confronting the man that was beating his wife. Uh, that guy goes off the deep end, and in retaliation, Rick has to kill him. Then, Rick starts sleeping with that guy's wife, then, during the herd invasion, Rick cuts off that girl's hand so that she would let go of Carl, basically sacrificing her to the herd in order to save Carl's life, only for Carl to immediately get shot in the face right afterwards. And considering the series' track record of killing characters, they could have killed Carl here, but I'm really glad they didn't. This moment kind of grounds Rick once more, in a way. It allows him to open up about his feelings of leadership and the example that he wants to set for Carl, how he wants to make the world better for Carl, that he wants to be that shining light, that he wants to be that example, that he wants to show that it's possible. And all of the regrets of his actions just kind of come pouring out to Andrea. Andrea does try to get with him, but Rick turns her down. I think it's a dynamic that could have worked, but... I don't know, I'll see where it goes in the future of the comics since that's not something that happens in the show. But Rick thinks about training all of the citizens here. He recognizes that the zombies themselves can be managed and it's other people that have always been the real danger. He has a good crew of fighters with him. He has himself, Abraham, Michonne, Andrea, and more of the people here could be taught how to defend themselves. And it's almost the cruelest irony ever that just as Rick has this revelation of hope and has these grounding of emotions... Some fucker named Jesus shows up and introduces the concept of multiple establishments and multiple towns that exist beyond their own. Now, as the second compendium begins to wrap up, this other town and the Jesus guy mention that they are under the rule and under the thumb of another group called the Saviors, led by a guy named Negan. And Negan, of course, is perhaps the most popular villain in the entire comic. I don't get to his introduction by the end of the second compendium, but the comic is building him up by establishing the lore around him and the town's fear of him, and responding with Rick's overconfidence, saying that they'll get rid of the saviors for them, believing themselves and their experiences thus far to give them the abilities needed to take them out fairly easily and make a deal with this new town in order to share resources between the two of them. They just have to get the saviors out of the picture. 
Now, I know because of the TV show, the impact Negan will have on the series, and I also know that after his introduction in the show, the show's quality goes down on a massive spiral. So I really hope that that's not the case with the comic because I really like where things are going right now, and I just hope that it doesn't jump the shark with the Negan introduction. But that's yet to be seen until I read the third compendium. But regardless, the second compendium here of the series was a great showcase of expanding the characterization of Rick and the other characters too, while also working on the world building and introducing more survivors and establishments that exist. I like turning Rick into this ferocious, need-to-survive kind of person and then just tossing him back into society and seeing how he deals with it. I love the father-son dynamics between him and Carl, and I don't mind the story kind of swaying away from zombies being the biggest threat, because I think it's always kind of been that way. The zombies are just zombies. They just want to eat you. They're pretty simple. They don't have the conflicting ideals and motivations and complicated personas that humans have. Humans have always been the main villain, and that's kind of true with a lot of zombie media and a lot of zombie lore, and zombie stories have always kind of been allegories for things that are happening in our real world. Humans have all the ego, they have all the pain, all the desires, and everything that can lead to both hope or devastation. Entering into the third compendium of The Walking Dead, I was very curious how the infamous Negan arc would actually go down. It's nearly impossible to be aware of The Walking Dead as a series, either in comic form or in television, without having some kind of awareness of who Negan is. Perhaps one of the most popular characters and the story's definitive villain. Which is wild when you consider just how insane the governor was, but also the governor in the TV version wasn't nearly as crazy as the governor in the comics, so I guess it didn't have as big of a cultural impact. But also you have had Rick's crew encounter a bunch of other crazy characters like the cannibals and, of course, you know, the zombies. And perhaps it may seem a little strange that with the appearance of Negan, the zombie threat does get pushed to the background a little bit. But as I was saying at the end of the last video that I made, I think the purpose of many zombie stories, not just The Walking Dead, is to emphasize the true horrors of humanity and the depths in which we can sink when law, authority, and order disappear and when we get pushed back more towards our primal selves. Pretty much every George Romero zombie movie is a commentary on the state of the world and humanity as a whole, and nearing chapter 100 of The Walking Dead, I do think it was a pretty good move to shift into another era and begin to focus on what happens a little ways into the zombie outbreak as opposed to just discovering it, as a way to see all these towns begin to set up establishments and the idea of where humanity can go now that we've begun to assemble once more. As well, the build-up to Negan works remarkably well. We begin hearing about him several chapters before his actual reveal, and the fact that Rick downplays this threat as something that they can easily handle also helps build up the tension when he eventually arrives. It feels so ominous, like, who the hell is this guy, and why have so many establishments been scared of him, and yet few have ever actually seen him. But before I get to his reveal, there are two very important story elements that happen beforehand. One is the unexpected death of Abraham. He's killed by a member of Negan's crew with an arrow through his head, and it's a pretty big bummer, especially since Abraham never even gets to meet Negan in the comic, and I think they would have had some really interesting interactions together. I get that Abraham is one of the best fighters, so it begins to put the protagonist at a disadvantage from the start with him not being there, but his end is very unceremonious and shifts away from it very quickly in the story. And unlike the upcoming death of Glenn, which feels huge, this one felt more like they just needed to get rid of him kind of quickly. The other thing is the official start of Rick and Andrea becoming a couple. And honestly, for me, it works pretty well. Characters hooking up in the story is pretty normal at this point. Also, they have always had some kind of chemistry, and they're both the most efficient members of the group. And honestly, I like this relationship a lot more than the Rick and Michonne one that they tried to do in the TV show. But yeah, let's talk about this, Negan's reveal and the infamous scene where it happens. A big muscular guy in a leather jacket, wearing a smile on his face, an extremely foul mouth, and a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire that he calls Lucille. 
But unlike the governor that was just out of his mind and chaotic, Negan is way more in control, and he's also genuinely enjoying the things that he's doing. He has an upbeat and pleasant personality, even when he's talking about horrific things like beating somebody to death. He seems extremely desensitized by it and very happy about the fact that he has to do it. But a lot of what he does also seems like a performance in order to make everybody see him in a particular light, which I also enjoy. Not that he doesn't actually genuinely enjoy what he's doing, but he's ramping it up tenfold just to put on that presence in front of other people. To me, Negan has always kind of reminded me of a mafia boss. I'm the motherfucking fucking one who calls the shots. Even his whole mission statement. He calls his group the saviors, basically offering protection of others in exchange for them giving them half their goods and resources. And of course, it's an offer that they can't refuse. He runs a multi-town organization and keeps others in line with fear, whether it be fear of the outside world or fear of what he will do to them if they don't comply. He's also smart enough to realize that Rick being the leader of this group, that if he were to kill Rick, he would just turn him into a martyr. He can't kill Rick, so he has to break Rick down. He has to show everybody that looks up to Rick that Rick will bow at his feet, which incites fear and defeat into the hearts of others. It's a very smart play. Negan is looking at the long term, and he's not basically making decisions on his emotions, which is what the governor did. But with that, they also have Negan kill a legacy character, and this is to set up the threat as something that is incredibly serious, and also let the reader know that nobody is safe from this guy, and Unfortunately, the character that was chosen was Glenn, savagely beaten to death with a bat, and it hurts. It hurt to watch in the show, and it hurts to read in the comic, even more so knowing that Maggie is pregnant at this point. Although, for some reason, I do think it works better in the comic version, and I haven't quite put my finger on why at this point. But I understand if there was any point in the story where you were going to kill off a legacy character or somebody that's been there from the beginning, it has to be this moment. You have to set Negan up as a legitimate threat. After all the crazy stuff that have happened in the story and other characters dying in different ways, this is a moment that you really need to solidify as a moment that the audience has to pay attention to. It can't be throwaway. It can't be something that Rick and the others are going to defeat in two chapters. This has to be something very important. And so because of that, I understand why Glenn was chosen. I don't think it would have worked the same if they chose a character that was newer or only introduced 10 to 20 chapters ago. You have to take a character that's been there from the beginning. But it doesn't break Rick down as much as it makes him vow to kill Negan at some point, although he will have to comply at least for a while. He has to pretend to comply in order to plot his retaliation, which will definitely take some time. Also, at this point in the story, it does begin to do a lot more with Carl's character, which I like. I'm not exactly sure how old Carl is supposed to be at this point, but at one point, he takes it upon himself to stow away in a truck towards Negan's compound, and when he gets there, he just starts blasting all of them with an automatic rifle, and it's badass. There's also this uncomfortable bonding moment between Carl and Negan as they have this conversation together, and Negan even gives Carl an inside look at his compound and how he conducts business, leaving Carl alive and then returning him to Rick unharmed as a way to show their compliance is his ultimate goal. It's also this kind of sadistic psychological tact to use where somebody does something really horrible to you to instill fear, but then turns around and does something very nice for you. I know there's a name for that, I just don't know what it is, but Negan's manipulation tactics are pretty much unmatched throughout this segment of the story. So Rick's crew scrambles for other ways to even the odds. Eugene begins making them bullets, which is a great way to make his character be useful once more. Rick then begins meeting up with other towns, also under Negan's thumb, in an attempt for them to join forces against him, the many rising up against the powerful few. One of the town leaders is this guy named Ezekiel with a pet tiger, pretty dope. He also views himself as a king and kind of puts on that performance to inspire his group, which I really like. And one of Negan's own crew members named Dwight also wishes to switch sides in order to help them out. The underlying idea is the potential of what can be accomplished with this uniting of humanity. It's what Rick wanted to do from the very start before the Negan scenario even happened. He wanted to rebuild the world, he wanted to train people, he wanted to give them jobs, he wanted to create a structure where everybody contributes in their own way. It turns out, the best way to jumpstart that is to unite under a common enemy. 
So the plan is hatched, and during one of Negan's visits, they launch an assault on them. Andrea barely makes it out alive from her bell tower sniping location, and even the tiger gets in on the action. Under Rick's guidance, the combined power of multiple towns do bring the fight to Negan's doorstep, even leading a horde of zombies to them as well. And this just continues retaliation. It leads to segments in the comic that is called All Out War, and yeah, it, it basically is. Negan attacks back by blowing the fuck out of Alexandria. The tiger eventually dies, which is one of the saddest deaths in the story besides Glenn. Characters lose their limbs. Rick is shot with an arrow. It all eventually leads to where they're forced to vacate until the final confrontation, because eventually Rick and Negan do come face to face once again, and Rick has this really long monologue that is basically the truth with a little bit of finessing. He asks why Negan is even fighting, what he is even trying to accomplish. Rick's intent before this whole mess was to have everybody work together, and he mentions that this can still happen. In a way, it can look like he's trying to talk no jitsu his way out of this, but everything he says has a point here, and there's always potential with that cooperation. And you can inspire and make people work harder instead of ruling them by fear if you feed into that potential. Everybody gets something out of it, and peace could eventually be achieved. And just as Negan begins to ponder Rick's words, Rick sneak attacks him and slices his fucking throat. Amazing. Love it. 10 out of 10. It's the exact opposite manipulation tactic that Negan uses. Both Negan and Rick do believe the things that they say, but they are also both putting on a performance for each other. They use the truth to lure each other right where they want them. It's a brilliant moment, but of course, Negan doesn't die here. Now, I have major issues with the TV series, and I dropped it shortly after the Negan arc there, especially pairing Negan up with Maggie. I'm just saying that if my wife didn't take the opportunity to kill the person who brutally murdered me with a baseball bat, I would haunt her from beyond the grave even more than I would haunt my murderer. I'm just saying. But I'm going to see where the comic takes it instead, because I know it goes in a different direction. There's also been issues in many different shows and stories where the villain character is so popular that they need to come up with reasons to not kill them and keep them in the story. And this often leads to an inevitable redemption arc. Sometimes that can work, and sometimes it's extremely forced and cringy. And again, I don't really know where this comic is going to take Negan, but I do hope they keep him as a villain, because for me... There's no redeeming this moment. I don't want to see him become a hero. I don't want to see him sacrifice himself to save somebody. I don't want any of that. I want a cathartic ending for him, but I don't know if I'm going to get that. But going in-universe, I do get the intent from Rick's character because he wants Negan to rot in a jail cell because, one, it will be a slow, painful end for Negan as he's trapped and forced to watch them thrive around him as he just wastes away, and two, it's Rick's sense of justice bringing back order and humanity to the world, especially since, you know, he used to be a cop. Well, I can see this justification. He's also gone off the deep end many times himself, and he doesn't want to do anything else that would be reminiscent of something that Negan would do. He wants to show himself to be better than Negan. He wants to show the townspeople they can be better than him. He wants to prove to everyone else that they can be civilized again, and I get it. I would also say that that's probably the conclusion of the Negan arc, but the compendium goes on a little bit further. There is a time skip that happens, and I'm not sure exactly how many years it is, but Rick has a buzz cut now with a beard and is still with Andrea. Carl is definitely a teenager at this point, and their towns are functional, farming, and everybody is working together just as he desired. It takes us right out of the anxiety and brutality of the war and puts us into peace for the first time in a long time. But that's just to juxtapose what is soon about to happen. We're updated on a lot of the characters at this point. Negan is still in his jail cell and casually having conversations with Carl from time to time. Carl wanting to move to the hilltop location to do some work there. And Carl has a lot more agency now with the time skip, and we get rid of a lot of those young kid tendencies. Of course, now we have teenage tendencies, but they tend to be a little bit more relatable and a little bit more interesting. And I like seeing Carl now as, unlike a lot of the adult characters in the story, most of Carl's life has been spent during this apocalypse, and he has little memory of his life before it. 
Now to counteract the thriving society at play, something is happening outside of these towns. Some of the soldiers keeping the perimeters clear of zombies thought that they heard some of the zombies talking, specifically whispering. And this introduces us to a new group of antagonists called the Whispers. But they're very different from what we've seen before. It seems like instead of trying to rebuild the world, they have submitted themselves to living alongside the zombies, living as primally as possible. They cover themselves in zombie skin, guts, and masks, and walk alongside them, hiding and waiting in the hordes for the right chance to strike. And instead of wanting to take over or rule, when they begin to cross paths with Rick's crew, they seem more curious than anything else, not unlike an animal in the wild watching you from afar wondering what it is you're up to. A young member of theirs named Lydia gets captured and begins a dynamic with Carl, and this is really interesting as a direction to take Carl because, as I said, he grew up within this apocalypse, and so he's had to do horrible things to survive from a very young age. He's grown accustomed to it in a different way than a lot of the other characters. Lydia also grew up during the apocalypse as well with the primal ideals of the Whisperers. Carl may in fact have more in common with her than he has with his own crew. Also, well, he's a teenage boy and she's attractive and wants to bang him. So, you know, there's that too. When the leader of the Whisperers, Alpha, Lydia's mom, takes her back, Carl runs off after them. While at the same time, there's this really cool parallel of Maggie almost getting assassinated, so she kills Gregory, the man that poisoned her, hanging him in front of everybody. Just at the same time, Rick, even knowing that Negan's cell was left open and unlocked, chooses to just lock Negan back up and keep him alive. Maggie quickly eliminated the threat in her town, where Rick is keeping the threat in his alive and well. And for all intents and purposes, Negan is the much larger threat. But when Rick finds out that Carl is missing, he sets out after him, meeting with the Whispers and Alpha. Their philosophies conflict, as Alpha stresses that to deal with the harsh, cruel realities of life, they must embrace their animalistic nature, and that this peaceful society is futile and will soon collapse. That the outside world is only for the strong. And viewing Rick, Carl, and now even her own daughter as weak, she tells them to leave. Oh, how nice of her. She just lets them all go. That's great. And, oh, no, actually, Alpha infiltrated the town earlier, learned about everybody, and murdered more than a dozen of people, including his equal, placing all their severed heads on pikes as a warning to them all. Yeah. Compendium 3 ends with Rick finding this out, falling to his knees, and contemplating what to do next. And I have to be honest, as much as the Negan stuff was great... These ideas intrigue me even more. Maybe it's that I'm getting into truly uncharted territory here, so I'm excited to see it. I dropped the TV show by this point, and this is my first time reading the comics, so I have no idea where the story is actually going to go from here, and I like that feeling. I like how different the Whisperers seem compared to all the other antagonists so far, and I like aging up Carl and giving him this relationship dynamic with Lydia. I like that we are beginning to see the seeds of opposing viewpoints into how they run their towns between Rick and Maggie. So, overall, I'm just really pumped to get to the fourth and final compendium. Okay, so the fourth and final compendium of The Walking Dead is, by far, my favorite part of the series. Wow. Okay, so The Whisperer's arc in its aftermath is an absolute testament to Kirkman's writing skills, and suddenly, I think all the themes of the story became very clear by the ending. My only struggle is going to be trying to put it all into words, but here is my attempt. So... Now we are in post-time skip, and there are primal human beings living among the zombies, covering themselves in human flesh, and basing all of their ideology on survival of the fittest. For any Roni Kenshin fans out there, it reminded me very much of Shishio's philosophy of, if you're strong, you live. If you're weak, you die. There is nothing else. Placing severed heads on the pikes to mark their territory, Rick and the others ponder whether or not to retaliate against them, and Rick doesn't want to. He has cultivated a peaceful way of life and knows starting another war will bring nothing but more casualties. And also, seeing how with all the experience of death that he's gone through, even though he mourns for those that he just lost, it's almost as if no different if they had been killed by actual zombies instead of people. But the town is not as lenient and they want to have their revenge. And it's interesting how Rick responds to this and what he says to them. He even speaks with a locked up Negan in order to get some advice on how to maintain control of such a large group of people. And I do like how Negan is kept out of the story for a little while during this. And also one of my biggest concerns was how he would be incorporated back into the story. 
Well, it all starts with a younger guy who doesn't like or trust Rick lets Negan out of prison, and it doesn't take Negan long to do away with him as he heads towards the Whisperers himself. One thing that I've always loved in all stories that I've read or watched is when villain characters interact, meet up, and even more than that, when villain characters go against one another. Negan's motives are unknown to the reader at first, but he comes across the Whispers, a top member calling himself Beta, and of course their leader, Alpha. Alpha is a woman, and Negan comes at her with uh, the, the best riz I've seen out of any character in the story, definitely swooning after her, or, or so it seems. He offers to become one of them, which seems so out of character at first, though through his trials, you do see how none of them tend to give a fuck about anything that happens. Nobody helps you, and if you're attacked, you have to fend for yourself. And even pissing Negan off is a girl that's about to get raped by two of them, but according to how they live and their philosophy, she can only be saved if she manages to fight them off herself. These people lead broken, disattached lives, ignoring emotion and empathy completely, and it's even too much for Negan to understand, but that's kind of how it plays into his character. He too has managed to detach himself and dehumanize others to get what he wants, but not to the primal extent that the Whisperers have. It's him that gets Alpha to admit that she does still have some emotion within her, and maybe she's not as strong as she pretends to be. But after that moment, Negan fucking kills her and cuts her head off. This moment had me shook. The man infiltrated, he earned their trust, he got the leader to open up emotionally, and then he just decapitated her. Negan is crazy. And he's definitely a prominent presence now, just as he was back in his own arc. But even crazier than that is that he did it, well, in his own twisted way, to give a peace offering to Rick. He's got nothing. He's got no one. The saviors are basically gone or want nothing to do with him. So he wants to be able to live in the town functionally and just not be in a jail cell. He could have gone anywhere, but he actually comes back to the town on his own accord and gives the severed head to Rick as a prize. And I was wondering how they were going to do Negan's story because it needs to stay nuanced. I don't want him to quote unquote turn good, even though good and evil aren't really terms that exist within The Walking Dead. But I also didn't want him to have a redemption arc per se. And I think the comic book does a really good job at kind of towing that line, doing it a little bit, but not all the way because... Negan is still Negan at the end of the day. He's still an asshole, he still swears constantly, he's still incredibly intelligent and manipulative, but between living in a jail cell and fighting for the town, he chooses to fight for them, even putting him alongside Dwight, who absolutely hates his guts and doesn't care if he lives or dies. They basically throw Negan on the front lines as, well, he can help out, but if he dies first, who cares? Obviously, with their leader dead, the Whisperers are going to retaliate, and they bring the biggest zombie horde that has ever been seen towards the entire town that Rick set up. Up. And it's great to see because it reminds us of what that initial problem of this comic was, motherfucking zombies. And since the whispers walk among them and control their direction by making subtle noises and movements, it's kind of like their own personal army. Negan does get his trademark weapon back, but it breaks when he attacks Beta, which is also a moment that you see Negan's sanity start to break. And here is where they deliver a bit of backstory and understanding for him, and that all is unveiled slowly as the giant horde breaks down the gate and both Negan and Rick are forced to be trapped together inside of a house. And this kind of stuff I love, when you force your main protagonist and antagonist to be stuck in one location, they're forced to interact with one another, and they only have one another to rely on, it's a good moment. And it's also a moment where Negan tries to get Rick to open up and talk to him, but since Rick refuses, Negan just decides to open up himself. Admitting what he did to Glenn was horrible, yet something that he felt he had to do and was able to do because of his ability to dehumanize others. We're basically all dead anyway, so what does it matter if somebody gets there a little bit quicker with Negan's assistance? It's a similar philosophy of the Whispers, but not quite as far as they take it. But the breaking of the bat kind of reminded him about his wife's death, and that's who he named the bat after, and the feeling that he had associated with it. Basically, like he put a lock on his empathy for survival, but by being forced to remember that one incident with his wife, well, Negan doesn't outright apologize to Rick, but more like, hey, I get it, that was fucked up, and he completely understands why Rick hates him. 
Now, all this is done well, and it's written in an interesting way, but it doesn't make up for the events that Negan did himself. And with that, I want to jump forward a little bit and talk about the finale of Negan's character. When the dust settles from the Whisperer's event, Negan is sent away to wander alone in the world. Eventually, Maggie goes after him, and she corners him alone, ready to kill him for what he did to Glenn. And Negan accepts this. He has nothing, he leads no one, he can't make amends, and so he even tells Maggie to pull the trigger getting to the point where he's begging her to do it, to put him out of his misery. Now, this is a moment that I had been waiting for ever since Glenn's death, but I'm a little bit torn on the decision, because Maggie ultimately decides not to kill him, with the reasoning being that she doesn't want to give him what he wants, and that he will suffer more if he's alive. Which, okay, I understand, if he wasn't given free reign, and he was still locked up in a jail cell. But she just kind of lets him go. And I understand the sentiment behind it, but this is it for Negan, at least as far as the main story goes. I'm sure there's side comics and side quests and stuff like that, but as far as the main series goes, this is it for him. Maggie leaves him, and then he burns his second attempt at making the Lucille bat, and then he walks away, accepting that his wife's gone for good, and so is his old way of life. But it's left up to the reader to think about what happens to him next. I'm really torn on it because I can buy Maggie keeping him alive to suffer, but it doesn't seem like he's going to. Also, he's not utilized for the rest of the series, and so this is the ending for him. All things being equal, he accepted his fate when Maggie had a gun to his head, so I kinda just wish Maggie killed him. If any character deserves to kill him, it's definitely Maggie. It's gonna take me a while to figure out if I'm okay with this ending for him or not, but here's the positive angle, and I think this is the most important aspect of it. And that's that Negan's sentiments were able to change, admittedly, because of Rick. Because Rick was able to show him another way, and that other way worked. During the Whisperer arc, Andrea is bitten. Now, Andrea has been there since the very beginning. She's grown into a great leader in her own right, and her relationship with Rick, I think, has the best chemistry of any dynamic in the series. Rick absolutely breaks over her injury and her slowly dying in the bed. And this moment hurts. Unlike any other death in the comic, this one is on another level, and it almost makes everything feel pointless, at least at first. Is Rick just not allowed to find peace or happiness? Is everything just about pain and death? Why come so far if this is going to be the result? Well, after her death and the tragedy that it is, there's this moment in the comic, her final words resonating within Rick's mind, that the world needs him, people need him, that he's managed to accomplish so much not only by trying desperately to maintain his own humanity, but also inspiring those around him on what can be done, living as if the world were as it should be to show it what it can be. He made people believe in themselves and their own potential. He established a functioning town. Even without seeing it himself, he has become this world's hero. Within the perspective of the main character, maybe we don't even see it as the reader at first, because we see his pain, we see his confliction, we see his mistakes, his self-doubt, and maybe it's similar to how we see ourselves. We only know ourselves from the inside. We know every broken emotion, we know every horrid mistake we've made, we know every bad memory, and so we don't see ourselves the same way as other people see us. There's pages of Rick falling to his knees and everyone else just placing their hands on his shoulders. Everyone else lifts him up. He made them stronger and so they in return make him stronger. The image is saying people need you. You have to keep going and there is still so much to do. And this is the message that Andrea leaves him with. This is what she understood about Rick that he didn't even understand about himself. And it is without a doubt the most powerful moment in the entire run of the comic and what I think the underlying theme of this whole experience has been about. Your death doesn't take away from your impact on the world. It's what you do while you're alive that matters. Who you are and what you mean to others continues to exist long after you're gone, and that is the feeling of this final mini arc. So the next part begins as if it's going to be another long arc, but it's really more of an epilogue before the actual epilogue of the final chapter. The seeds are planted early. During the earlier portions of the Whisperer segment, Eugene got a radio working and was talking to somebody on it somewhere, slowly sharing information. Eventually, it's found out it's from not just a town, but like an entire giant working city called the Commonwealth, complete with people working regular jobs, football games, and even politicians. 
the amount of people living here is insane compared to what we've seen so far. And here, even Michonne's daughter, who we long since thought died, is still alive. The basic idea of this segment is to set the Commonwealth is meant to be set up to match our current society or the one that we would be familiar with, which means there are social classes. Michonne used to be a lawyer, so they want her to be a lawyer again and put her in a wealthy building. But others before the outbreak worked lower wage jobs, and so that's where they believed they belong, and they have a militant police force in order to enforce this. It's definitely social commentary on how socioeconomic status affects how we view each other. During the apocalypse, everybody is equal. Everybody's the same. We're just trying to survive. Rick's town has everyone do equal work. There's equal housing, equal wealth. It's more primitive, but everybody pulls their own weight in their own way, and everyone gets to live. But the thing about the Commonwealth is that it seems like it's going to be another things are not what they seem villain arc as much as some of the people that live there are plotting an uprising and Michonne battles with what she should do when they want her to defend the officers that beat down a civilian. And it's definitely Kirkman's commentary probably on our current society, but I don't think that it gets too preachy, even though it quite easily could have, because what it's really doing is leading towards the ultimate culmination of Rick's character arc. Riots, protests, even more zombie invasions, it all happens, but Rick Grimes is the one to stand up for everybody. He's the one that's able to make everybody stand down for a moment and listen to him, pointing out that their governor only wants to maintain power, but he knows that she can be a better person, that if they have to rebuild the world, they don't have to make the world like it was before. We don't have to imitate what didn't work before, and we could all build something new. All his trials, all his struggle, all his pain, all the wars, and his perseverance, it leads him to the biggest establishment known in the U.S. and a cry and declaration for peace. And that's the power of Rick Grimes. And if he had given up, or if he had let his demons take over, none of this would have happened. But of course, that leads to what I can only imagine was probably the most controversial moment of this entire thing. That night, the son of the Commonwealth's governor sneaks into Rick's room and shoots him in the chest. A weak, cowardly character who never experienced any real pain in his life, fumbling with a gun and pulling the trigger. The last kind of person you would ever expect to kill Rick. And in a very unceremonious way for this main character who has gone through so much to go. But here's how I see it. Death as a concept not the specific way that you go, but just death in general, it's coming for all of us, and it's often unpredictable. No one can prepare you for it, and most people never get to die the way that they wish they could. Heroic deaths are often in fantasy, and real death is, well, real. It's sudden, it's painful for everybody involved, and it's not what we want to go through. Even though this series is about zombies, you know, it has always treated death as tragic and unexpected. If anyone has lost a loved one, you know what that feeling is like. But Rick's death, again, does not change what Rick accomplished or what he meant to other people. Rick's legacy will go on far longer than his cowardly killers. He left an impact on the world because he didn't give up. And no matter how he died, that doesn't change what he did. But he had to have the courage to keep going in order for that to happen in the first place. Rick's death is tragic, yes, but all death is tragic, and The Walking Dead has always been very honest about that fact. The final chapter, time skips again, and we see Carl as a much older man. And ultimately, he seems to have married Sophia and not Lydia. Lydia felt like a better match to me when they were teenagers, but I can buy this too because, you know, things change and fall apart over time. Also, Carl and Sophia would now be the only surviving characters from the very beginning, so it's fitting in a way. It seems now times are very different. Carl kills a zombie and actually gets in trouble for it because zombies are now considered property, this one belonging to Maggie's son. He even has to go to court for it, and Michonne is the judge. But it's safe to say, although zombies still exist, within this past decade or two, it's become very manageable and much more rare to see attacks. And society is functioning, all possible because of the impact of Rick Grimes. The world remembers and honors him as an inspiration, but Carl remembers him on a much deeper level. Carl was with him through everything. He saw every heartbreak, every death, every breakdown, and every attempt for peace— and as Carl reads a story to his daughter that he named after Andrea, he tells her about the vision that Rick had, about how he doubted himself so many times but kept going. No matter what happened, he struggled forward. And I think that's the point. Life can be horrible, painful, messy, and unpredictable, 
but you cannot quit. And whether it's written down or just from somebody's memories, those you love will tell stories about you long after you're gone from this world. The ending of the series can feel a bit sudden, but again, it's the idea that death is the reality. It is sudden. But the way that Kirkman was able to express this through Rick and Carl was really beautiful. Truth be told, I was spoiled on the final chapter because I remember people talking about it when it came out, but that did not lessen its impact for me when I read it for myself. I think Walking Dead is a series that gets consistently better over time, and even if there is a few moments or choices that I don't agree with, overall, the experience was well worth it. This is miles better than the TV show, and outside all of the spin-offs and trying to milk it for profit over and over again from the franchise, this comic is the purest and best way for you to experience the story of Rick Grimes and The Walking Dead, so go read it. Anyways, guys, thank you for watching this video, and thank you for coming with me on my Walking Dead journey. I have now reviewed all four compendiums, so check those videos out. I'll also probably put all four reviews into one big video at some point, so that'll be coming out too if you want to just watch it that way. Anyways, guys, if you like this video, please leave a like and a comment because it will help it out in the algorithm. Also, if you want to support the channel on a deeper level, I have channel memberships, Patreon, merch store, link down below, as well as all the various social media links where you can follow me. Other than that, guys, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll talk to you next time. Okay, so truthfully, I'm only a couple seconds away from hitting the one hour mark on this video, and I feel like that would make it look better in the algorithm for people to find. So to buy up the time, I'm just going to mention to you that there's a side comic that's like five or six issues long called Rick Grimes 2000, where during the zombie apocalypse, Rick gets knocked out again, wakes up in bed again, except this time the world is overrun by alien monsters, and he has to fight them with a lightsaber. Rick is dressed up kind of like the invincible superhero from Kirkman's other comic. Andrea and Lori are very scantily clad and probably the best they ever looked. Uh, Negan is riding around on a glider like the fucking Green Goblin. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure what to do with this information. I should probably read it. But it exists. And it's also written by Robert Kirkman. So uh, try to find it.